Hello, Cameron Bertuzzi here with Capturing Christianity, and I wanted to give you a quick heads up on this video before it begins. So the video that you're about to watch was actually recorded back in May of 2022 at the first CC Exchange event that we've done. And so this is a video, obviously, with myself and Joe Schmid from Majesty of Reason. We talked about intellectual virtues and vices, but the reason why I'm actually giving you a heads up here before this video starts is because the audio is a little messed up. Basically what happened, short story is, uh, one of the microphones was muted. Joe's in particular was muted during the talk. So what we had to do was recover Joe's audio from my microphone. Again, this wasn't on purpose. It was completely accidental. It doesn't It didn't happen in the later events that we recorded that day. But so what we had to do is basically I had my audio engineer. He was trying to pull the audio from my microphone and try to like clean it up so that it's audible. I did what I can to kind of help out as well. But I think in the in the end, the end result, you can actually hear everything that's going on, everything that's being said. It is a little bit difficult at points, but I did want to just give you a heads up before you watch the video. Other than that, enjoy. It was a great session between Joe and I. I really, really enjoyed it. The Q&A at the very end was also a lot of fun. So yeah, other than that, enjoy the video. So welcome again to the CC Exchange. This is our first one. Uh, and welcome everyone watching on YouTube. Welcome to the Capturing Christianity CC Exchange event. And uh, we're going to kick things off. Well, I guess we've already kicked things off with the exclusive ticket holders. But this is our first like recorded event with Joe. And we're going to be talking about intellectual virtues and vices. And how should we begin? I mean, let's just let's just uh, jump right in. So we have this like little slideshow that we're going to share with you guys if you want to uh, follow along. Not right now. We're going to actually share it afterwards. But yeah, let's just get started. I'm, I'm gonna kind of let, like, let you kind of guide us because you actually put the slideshow together and everything. And so I'm just kind of kind of like let you go because you're, yeah. Testing, okay. Yeah, so we wanted to talk about intellectual virtues and vices, like what they are, how to try to cultivate them, different tangible tips and so on. And actually, yeah, let's talk about why we're doing this yeah. in the first place. There are, there are a number of different reasons why we're doing this. I mean, one reason is just because this is so neglected in so many different areas. Like, If you look on YouTube for like intellectual virtues and vices, there's like four videos that pop up. Exactly. And it's from like Steubenville, like the Catholic, like, <laughs> like yeah. and that's it. But, yeah, exactly. So it's like, it's much overlooked. And it's like, this is the foundation for critical thinking, the foundation for being able to have dialogues across ideological barriers. If you don't have intellectual virtues and so on, you're basically foundationless. You're like a, a ship without a mask or whatever. So, you don't have the, the proper mental and characteristic orientation, really. So, I mean, that's that's one reason why we're doing this. And I mean, there are some other reasons that's later on in the slides as to uh, like, why does all of this matter? Um, I guess let's talk about why does it matter a little bit more after we lay out what the intellectual virtues actually are. So I guess I can probably start like with virtues, right? So virtues, yeah, yeah what? Well, I just said, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, virtues, as uh, I kind of put it here, firstly, they're excellent char character traits. So they're excellences. So they're like great making features in some sense. And they're character traits. So we're not just talking about something like a mood or things like that, but they're really traits of your character. Like what you're like in a kind of consistent basis, or at least what you can try to cultivate on a consistent basis. The second thing about them is that they're teleological. So they're directed towards something. In the case of intellectual virtues, they're directed towards truth, maybe, maybe greater understanding, but the reason why you're trying to develop these intellectual virtues, the reason why you're cultivating them, is to try to hit more truths and have fewer falsehoods within your web of beliefs. So it's kind of teleological, you're directed towards something. In the case of moral virtues, you'd be directed towards the good. So you're directed towards the good, in the case of moral virtues, directed towards the true, in the case of the intellectual virtues. There are also dispositions to act, think, feel, and want. So it's not only like your various actual traits that you have, but dispositional traits. Like if you were put in such and such a situation, how would you respond? And not only respond, but how would you act in that situation? Would you be condescending towards someone with whom you disagree? Would you be defensive? Would you do various sorts of things? And how would you think in particular? Like what, what are the sorts of mechanisms that are going on in your mind? Are you going to kind of defensive mode? Are you going into debate mode and those sorts of things? Or are you kind of trying to explore these topics with people? 
dispositions to feel as well. When your views are challenged, do you start to feel threatened? Do you start to feel under attack? Things like that. So intellectual virtues kind of have this effect where they not only pervade our like thought lives, but they also pervade our emotional lives. They can affect your emotional responses to situations. They're also habitual, so that's another characteristic of them. So you can try to develop these through continued practice and so on. We're going to talk about some tangible tips later on. And then finally, finally they promote flourishing. Yeah, and this is like the most exciting one to me. Yeah, the, exactly. the, the fact that they promote flourishing. Yeah, this is how you. This is how you're a flourishing human being. You live out the intellectual virtues. You live out the moral virtues as well. These are aspects of your flourishing. A flourishing human being partly flourishes to the extent that they exhibit these intellectual virtues, to the extent that they have epistemic humility, to the extent that they have epistemic curiosity, and these sorts of things. Like, again, because they're excellences. They promote flourishing. So that kind of leads us with advice. Do you have anything to say about that? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, like like I said, I'm kind of going to let you go because you put the, the whole slideshow together. And I'm going to, like, interject as, as we go along. Well, especially the those tips. And exactly. But the vices... Uh, the fact that you like the way that you put this together, the vices are basically just the opposites. Yeah. And yeah, I'll, I'll let you go. Yeah, so vices, I had sort of five different characteristics that I was describing of the virtues. Uh, the vices are kind of just the opposites, right? It's not excellent character traits, but bad character traits. Not teleological, but in some sense, dysteleological. These vices, they are taking you off the path towards truth. They are, they're also dispositions to act, think, feel, and want, and so on. They're various shall we say, vicious ways to think, feel, want, and act. And they're also habitual, so they share that in common. You can develop these sorts of things through continued practice, continued vicious thinking, and so on. And they also promote languishing. They don't prevent, promote your flourishing. Because they're, they're off track. They're taking you off the track to truth, right? Because, after all, it's, it really goes down to that teleological character of them. So anyway, that's vices. And I guess now we can probably ask, like, why care? Well, we, we didn't talk about the fact that it promotes languishing. Yeah, I mean, it's just... It essentially, because it's the opposite of intellectual virtues, the way, like, the way that you are a flourishing human being is you cultivate those virtues. And so if you don't cultivate them, you're in some sense language and you're missing out on that flourishing that you could be developing. It's like uh, water for plants, essentially. You need to feed your intellectual life and you need to feed yourself in such a way that you have the correct dispositions, virtues, and so on. And if you're not doing that, if you're feeding the plant soda or something, or like acid, uh, that's similar to feeding your mind advice, essentially. Yeah. And so the, the next slide is why should we even care about this? Yeah, like what, okay, so we've defined virtues and vices. Like why, why does this matter at all? Yeah, and the first thing is it's intrinsically valuable. Yeah. But a lot of people, even including here, actually, can I get a show of hands? How many of you are non-theists? So it looks like about, what would you say, about 20%? 20% of the 30, crowd? 40. 30, 40, okay. Yeah, I'd say 30%. 30%, okay. Yeah, so, uh, well, some, some non-theists are going to reject that it's intrinsically valuable. That's fine. I mean, we yeah. can say it stands dependently valuable to appease them, even though they're wrong. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, these, these things are intrinsically valuable. And yeah. of course, I, I agree that there's much debate to be had about these sorts of things. But at least by my lines, we could say these things are really intrinsically valuable. They're deeply valuable in and of themselves. There's something about seeking truth. There's something about epistemic humility. There's something about... It's not about the various ways that these things are that are this valuable. It's but how does how does like truth seeking actually promote flourishing? Like that's that's the next thing. Like why it cares because it, it promotes flourishing. Couldn't someone who is like not seeking the truth still live a great life and like you know flourish or yeah. so to speak? They definitely could. It's just one thing that I think would probably add to it essentially. Okay. It's one thing that, that super adds to their life. You know, someone could definitely have a family and you know be super morally upright and so on. But the intellectual virtues just kind of add to that. It's you're feeding the mind. That's just one aspect of the human person. Yeah. Like we have yeah. psychological needs, these various other sorts of needs. But of course, intellectual needs are something that can be promoted as well. Yeah. So anyway, I, I just, I might answer answer intrinsically valuable, but of course, as you point out, people can disagree about it. Yeah. The second thing we already covered, which is promoting flourishing and so on, like the good life. Um, and then, of course, increasing truth and decreasing falsehood, right? It's precisely by practicing these sorts of virtues that you're going to be able to increase your stock of beliefs and decrease your stock, or increase your stock of true beliefs yeah. and decrease your stock of false beliefs. And that's precisely because exhibiting these, it, it's a way to direct your mind to truth instead of directing it away from it. And then finally, it builds relationships, right? So if you want to have good conversations with people, if you want to be able to engage in dialogue across ideological barriers, if you don't want to have those 
Thanksgiving dinners where you're just calling your, your liberal uncle a, a moron and then he's calling you like a dipwit or something or whatever. <laughs> yeah, and, and this, this we'll be able to see a lot more clearly once we actually go through the list of virtues and then the keys as, as well. Exactly. You're so build, stay tuned. Build barriers, or not build barriers. Don't build barriers. You're building bridges. You're just building bridges. Build barriers between, let's say, theists and atheists. This is how I've been able to build so many different relationships with people with whom I just vehemently disagree. So, yeah, and it's like, like Alex. <laughs> it's a particularly beautiful kind of relationship. Precisely, despite your disagreement, you're able to see that you're on a common path for truth, in which we're going to get to later. Yeah. Okay, so that's why I care. Now. Now we kind of just want to go through some key virtues. Like, what are they? And then we're going to go through some tips about how to try to cultivate virtues and so on. And then after that, we're going to do some Q&A, yeah. actually. So if you guys have questions as we're going through this, keep them in your mind. And then I'm going to have you guys line up over here. I'll give you more instructions as we go on a little bit later. So, but we are going to do some Q&A a little bit later. Yeah, I also noticed I forgot to cover a slide, which is that uh, I wanted to say this at the beginning. Because I can already hear from miles away, the furious typing. You guys aren't perfect. You guys don't have these. Yeah. You guys fail on these on a daily basis. I say yes. He's uh, like, I fail on these every single day, right? So my first slide on this is that we aren't perfect. We're not up here on some moral or even intellectual or epistemic high ground, some virtue high ground. We're, I just I've looked at some of these sorts of things and I collected together a list of virtues and I try to promote those in my life, but I always fail, right? I'm imperfect. I wanted to say that from the start. Neither of us are claiming perfection or even some high ground on this. We're just talking about this to try to help serve you. That's, that's the purpose of this. No one is trying to claim a high ground here. We are not perfect. We fail on these every single day. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah, we're constantly trying. Well, personally, I'm, I'm trying to grow and it's, it's uh, yeah, we fail. Very tough. But anyway, I, we should have said that at the beginning because now yeah. we, we have not circumvented, we've not prevented those angry, furious typers, <laughs> which I'm very sad about. <laughs> and they're probably like literally typing right now. Oh, well, they, they already finished. They clicked away. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they clicked away 10 minutes. They didn't even watch the video. Yeah, no, probably. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as per usual. Okay, so uh, let's see. <laughs> What would some of the virtues that we wanted to cover? So the first one, I believe... Let's get some audience interaction. Like, what would be... Just think about an intellectual virtue. What would be, like, the first one that comes to mind? Greg? Humility. Humility. Anyone else? Honesty. Honesty. Sure. In the back, Zach? Curiosity. Curiosity. That is our first one. That is our first one. Nice. So, uh, yeah, curiosity. Yeah. It's the first one because it's... Well, not all of them. Some of these we just put together in a random order. But this one was specifically chosen for me first. Because it's the motivating virtue. It's the virtue which is almost like the driver behind lots of the other ones. It's precisely because you have curiosity, you want to learn more, you have this kind of voracious appetite to learn, to, to seek truth, and to discover things, that you're motivated to kind of pursue issues further, pursue discussions with people with whom you view it and disagree, and so on. So it's almost like the virtue that's kind of the, I guess, the, the, the kickstarter. As it were, it so, inquiry. It kickstarts kickstarts discussions. That's why it's the motivating version. Who who in here feels like you're not that curious, like intellectually curious, or you're not as curious as you as you could be? Well, I'm not. Does as anyone feel? Like, yeah. I mean, it's it's like a virtue, right? But then you have to think about like, are we actually? Do we have these dispositions already, or are these things that we're trying to like strive for? And curiosity, I feel like, yeah, I feel like I'm curious. But am I, am I curious enough? Like, do I cultivate that virtue to the degree at which I should? Yeah, exactly. And that's, all, that's, that's another thing about virtues. It needs to be an appropriate amount. Like, you, you shouldn't be so curious <laughs> to the extent that, like, you're ignoring a family, family obligations, <laughs> not going to school. Like, you're just like, and it all, so it depends. Like, you have to have an appropriate degree or level of curiosity. That's another thing to say. As, um, but how do you, like, yeah, but how do you, like, go about getting more curiosity if you're like not curious enough well part of it might just be like exposing yourself trying to find the areas of inquiry and so on that really pique your interest like maybe you're super interested in engineering awesome go at it man that's so cool right or maybe you're really interested in the modal ontological and awesome go at it cool you know those sorts of things maybe you're really interested in like uh, curious curiosity and developing interpersonal relationships that's also another area which you can explore and so on so it's it's all about we're not trying to impose some like, oh, you can only be curious about philosophy. No, we're not saying that. Try to find the, uh, I guess, the areas that are firstly good, but secondly, that you can cultivate the kind of curiosity within those areas. So, okay, that's what we wanted to say about curiosity. 
The second one, this one's interesting. Should we ask them to credit guess it? We can. Yeah, you're, you're wanting to get in, in, in on the uh, the audience interaction. Let's let's do it. Uh, well, just, just name some more uh, virtues that haven't been named so far. Kyle, say that again. Charitability. Charitability. That's later. Yeah, it's later on in our list. Pete. Authenticity. Authenticity. I don't think we even covered that one. I don't think we even covered that one. That was a good one. Wade. Empathy. Empathy. Yes, we do cover that one a little bit later on. Do what? Hard work. Hard work. Intellectual hard work. Intellectual, what would you say? Yeah, that's the, yeah. there's another word for that on our list later. Okay. Anyway, they're, sorry, you're not going to guess this one. <laughs> um, it's called intellectual autonomy. So this is really a matter of thinking for yourself. And again, this is all a balancing act. It's not as though you were this like lone wolf Cartesian ego, which is like all in your own and you're just trying to figure out the mysteries of the universe just by contemplating on your mind. Uh, no, of course not. But it's really just thinking for yourself, taking a hold of your own intellectual pursuits, your own intellectual inquiry, you're not just completely deferring all of your beliefs, your thoughts, and so on to others, right? We all, you know, your parents and your younger, like, don't just be a follower, right? Be a leader in some certain respects. Be a leader in your thought life. So that's one thing that I try to keep in mind. Like, Who feels like if anyone else's views, right? Yeah. This is my own worldview that I'm building. And there's some sense in which I can think for myself and construct certain things. Like, I have to weigh the plausibility of these arguments. I don't have to defer just to this other person who does all the hard work for me. Oftentimes you can and have to do that, right? So engineers, I don't build bridges. <laughs> and I have to rely on engineers and their mathematical prowess to do that. Um, but other areas, um, you just shouldn't defer on absolutely everything where you're almost just this like passive, mindless robot. So who, who feels like they're not, they, they don't think enough for themselves? Could be anybody. Yeah, I mean, do you feel that way? Yeah. I mean, I feel like there are some- Even Joe, Joe Schmid feels like he doesn't think enough for himself. How about you, Alex? Do you think enough for yourself? Never. Never. <laughs> who do you rely on? Like, like for real though, who, who do you rely on as like someone who you feel like you kind of like let them do some thinking for you? Matt Dillon. <laughs> <laughs> Where do we begin here? He said Matt Dillon. He said Matt Dillon. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky to- some great experiences with uh, tutors at university who are well known, famous. If you find somebody who just kind of clicks with you in particular, they can be incredibly smart and useful if you just don't actually interact with them very well. But it's about, I think, finding somebody who isn't just a good thinker, but a good conversation as well that helps you to, to sort of start thinking yourself. One person in my life who's like helped me try to think for myself is Josh Rasmussen. Like, that's his. I was gonna say it's his song. Is that the right way to put that? I don't think it's, it's a characteristic is. bird song. If you hear a it, characteristic it. bird song. Yeah, you're like, that is to say. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next one. Intellectual humility was one that was already brought up by the audience. Yeah, this one's good. So intellectual humility is a matter of. I like the way that how you, how you put it here. Yeah, it's not just being like, oh, I'm so sucky, I'm so bad, oh, it was me, <laughs> like those sorts of things. No, it's a sensitivity to limitations. That's what intellectual humility is. So we can kind of break these down. It's being appropriately sensitive to your limitations, but also your strengths. Right? You're not just underestimating yourself all the time. You recognize your strengths. Yeah. Right? That you are competent in certain areas. You recognize your level of competence. What you don't know, what you do know, and those sorts of things. Right? You're sensitive to your limitations. Not only the limitations of you as a like, thinker, as an individual, as um, a critical thinker, but also sensitive to the limitations of your evidence base. Right? Not all of us are aware of all the evidence and considerations that there are. In fact, none of us are. Right? And so we, have to be, we really have to be clued in as to there are things that we haven't explored, right? Certain debates in, let's say, philosophy of time, like we might have a view there, you might be a presentist, you might be an internalist, but it, you need to be sensitive to the limitations of your evidence, the, the books that you've read, the papers you've read, and so on, to recognize that there's a huge body of literature out there from people that are much smarter than you, who've done a dissertation on the topic, who disagree with you, and so on. So it's just a sensitivity to your limitations. That's not to say that you can't take a position on these sorts of matters, but just to be sensitive to your own intellectual abilities in this regard, but also sensitive to your evidence base, the limitations of your evidence base, but also, in some cases, the uh, the prowess of your evidence base, the, the, the actual evidence that you do have. So it's a recognition, not only of your limitations, but also of your strengths. It's being appropriately in tune with them. 
So it's not just a matter of thinking, oh, I'm so terrible, I'm so sucky, I have to lower my confidence on everything. It's an appropriate confidence. Yes, C.S. Lewis was famous for pointing out that humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's just thinking accurately of yeah. yourself. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, what this shows is like, it's being, this is the teleological character of virtue, right? You're being attuned with the fact of the matter, being attuned, you're attuning your mind to the status, not only of, let's say, your abilities to ascertain information, to sift through the evidence and so on, but also being able to ascertain how much evidence you have, the extent of it, the quality of it, and so on. So yeah, that's intellectual humility. Yeah. The next one is very, very important. Intellectual carefulness. And I have a kind of little sub slide, what is it, a subtitle on this one? So the title of the slide is Intellectual Carefulness. The subtitle is Being Quick to Listen and Slow to Speak. Kind of rude. How about you tell us a little bit about that? <sighs> The, yeah, I, I actually just talked about this in a video that I just posted on my channel is where in my conversation with my brother when he became an atheist, what I wanted to do instead of listen to him is I wanted to just like blurt out answers and I wanted to like give him what I didn't actually have. But I wasn't careful. I like wasn't actually trying to listen to what he was saying, think about it, ponder it like honestly. And then I, I wasn't even prepared to say, you know, I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't prepared to, to admit ignorance. And I think that's part of being careful is being able to listen, being able to recognize your own limitations. It's, I mean, and a lot of these virtues like have, they, they overlap. Exactly. Well, there's another one here. It's a fact of developing lots of the other ones. Yeah. So yeah, it's just listen. I mean, oftentimes so much in life, you just either not listening to people, truly trying to get into their perspective. And we're waiting, we're just waiting for our chance for your time. To, to talk. You're waiting for your time to respond. So that's really what intellectual carefulness is. It's like really being careful with how you listen to people, you know exactly what they're saying, you get clarification on what they're saying before just blurting out a response. But also, you're not just blurting out a response to get a response out there. You know, you're not just trying to save face in some sense. You're not just trying to win, to make it seem as though your side can answer all the questions. Intellectual carefulness is really a matter of, again, being quick to listen, listen to the other people, and being slow to speak. To I think charitable them. is another way of yeah, exactly. putting it, just being charitable. Is another aspect of being careful, right? Uncareful thinkers are uncharitable thinkers, really. They are uncareful in that they, they really don't really care with the other person, what they're, <laughs> what they're trying to say, and they're perfectly fine with misconstruing it so as to be able to knock down a straw man or whatever. So these, again, this is just this is how you lay the foundations for good critical thinking, for good discussions, and so on. I mean, even with a classroom, like I can't believe that this sort of stuff isn't taught in like primary and secondary education. Like this, it's just absurd. Honestly. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we don't need to get into this. Yeah, let's not digress. So yeah, that's intellectual carefulness. What about the next one? Can you take the next one? So intellectual perseverance, going deep, embracing struggle, and the growth mindset. Yeah, I mean, and this is one. I suppose that I struggle with myself is being able to persevere through intellectual challenges. And, and I, I do, I like, I want to fall back on these people who I think are like my intellectual heroes. And so perseverance is something that I personally struggle with, but it is super important to, to push past that and to, to go deep and to embrace the struggle. Yeah, the, I, so the little, the subtitle there was going deep, embracing struggle, and the growth mindset. So those are kind of three different things that I want to pack with one. So one of them was going deep, right? <laughs> Often, I don't know, you kind of see, you see someone, and this is perfectly fine, but if someone is, I don't know, they, they just give an argument, they give it like a, they trot out a stock argument, let's say for or against the existence of God, and it's like they leave it at that. They don't go and try to see the way that atheists are responding to these sorts of things, so the atheists are responding to them. They hear an argument, and they're like, oh, the issue's settled, right? It's done. The yeah. inquiry's done. You just hear, like, like say the syllogism of the claw, and you're just like, okay, yeah, the, the matter is settled. But to be a truly intellectually responsible thinker, you need to have this intellectual perseverance. No, what are some criticisms of this? Especially if it's a conclusion that you like. <laughs> Think, like, uh, the very fact that you like the conclusion should increase your skeptical vibes, really. Try to persevere. What do these, what are the people who disagree with me, or what are they saying about this? What are some of the best criticisms of this? You need to seek those out, find those. Go yeah. deep into the matter. So just settle for the surface level argument. I see this so much in like the atheist community, the theist community, and so on. One question though is like, how deep do you actually go? Yeah, and I think that's- And like, when do you know when to stop, you know? Because you could like, 
you, you, one thing that you learn as you get into philosophy is that like you, as it, it, one argument, like the modal ontological argument, then you're looking into modality and like, what is modal logic? And there's all of these different areas that open up. And like, I remember when I was looking into the, the modal ontological argument, I started, I bought a book on modal logic and like how to understand possibility and necessity. And I like, I, was I, was that the right path for me to go? Like, do, should I have looked into a modal logic in order to understand the argument? Yeah, probably. But I, it's still, it's still kind of a question, like how, how deep do you actually go? I, I think it depends on your state of life and your purpose for like looking at these sorts of things. Like some people's state of life, you just have to recognize, yes, yeah, some people work like nine to five, they have four kids, maybe they're a single parent and so on. And there are ways that they can do this even in their own life. Um, like not just scratch the surface with someone with whom they're trying to you know, develop a relationship with, but going deep in that sort of relationship, not just try, trying to settle for the, I guess the superficial side of things. And Again, it just depends on your, your, the state where you are in life. I mean, those sorts of yeah. people don't need to be going and buying a modal logic book and so on. But that's where, that's where you get the interplay between these different uh, intellectual virtues, right? Precisely because they don't have the time or the energy or even the resources uh, or the education to look into these things, to pursue them in that kind of depth, they should then recognize the, that limitation and maybe not so confidently put out the modal ontological argument because they haven't gone so deep. So this is where there's a kind of trade-off in this, and this is where it's just an appropriate level, right? It's not necessarily yeah. going as deep as you possibly can. If you did that, you would be, I wouldn't be here. I'd be having my book buried in like logic and theism and these other like crazy books by philosophers and so on. So it's it's just it's dependent on your walk of life, really. Let's uh, let's try to go a little bit quicker yeah. through these because we're going to get through the keys too. Okay, yeah, yeah, those are yeah, the steps. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to say one last thing on on perseverance is I think that when you find something that you're super passionate about in the realm of philosophy or apologetics or atheology, whatever it is, that like when you find your thing, like for me, it's the argument from contingency. I love that argument. I've read like everything that I can on it. And that's the thing I think where I'm trying to grow in that virtue with perseverance with respect to like this particular argument. And I think that that's one way that this can apply to everybody here is find the thing that you're just sort of naturally passionate about uh, in the realm of philosophy and then persevere in that particular... Or wherever, I mean, it might be. I mean, of course, because we're in the apologetics world and so on. But again, for other people, it might be engineering and those other sorts of things. Um, and I just want to really... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we have it on here embracing struggle. So, right, embrace the struggle. Embrace the difficulty of searching truth. I mean, it's difficult, right? Try to, try to embrace that just because there's some sort of uh, hurdle that you're at or some sort of problem. Ruminate on it. Don't just say you hit a stumbling block and just give up, right? That's one thing that's super important in education is this, this growth mindset, right? If you fail in some particular respect, your mindset shouldn't be, uh, I'm just done with this, I, can't, I really can't do this. I mean, maybe at some point, yeah, but <laughs> setting that aside, like, you have to have this growth mindset, right? Failures, that's an opportunity to learn. Like that failure that you have with your brother on the, the, the initial conversations, a growth mindset would allow you to kind of learn from that failure and to not implement it again to try to change your strategy. To yeah. Growth. So it's that growth mindset. Embrace the struggle. Firstly, embrace the struggle. Of, yeah, truth seeking is hard. It's difficult. But um, try to grow from it. Embracing the growth mindset. It's not all cut and dry. Uh, like, oh yeah, this argument just just has to be proved something and it's done once and for all. Um, but try to embrace the struggle. Go deep. So yeah. Anyway, the next one is intellectual autonomy. No, that I went backwards. No, you're right. Intellectual autonomy is the next intellectual one. Intellectual autonomy. So yeah, basically just taking, this is similar to one of the other ones, but just intellectual autonomy is a matter of taking responsibility for your own pursuit of truth. It's again, not really trying to defer. To, again, you can, and oftentimes you should, and we have to, but not absolutely universally everywhere. You just just defer to someone else, and they do the hard thinking for you. They they construct the worldview for you. They do all these sorts of things for you, and you just kind of mindlessly go about as a passive recipient of these sorts of things. Actively chew on these sorts of things. Do you have good reasons for these? It's a matter of being autonomous in your intellectual life, taking responsibility for what you believe for your worldview and so on. It's really and I, I, beliefs, not someone else's. It's not your parents' beliefs and so on. It's you. This is your worldview. It might be similar to theirs, but it's precisely because you own it and you, you take responsibility for it and you have the reasons for it. In this, though, I think that we, we still need to recognize our limitations, mm -hmm. right? We still need to be humble. And when we take responsibility, we still need to remember, like, what our limitations actually are. And that's, that's one thing. It's like it's difficult with autonomy is how, when, when do we know to rely on others, you know? What, at what point do we rely on, on other people who are smarter than us? 
who can like really go deep into the arguments and uh, they're able to raise objections that we can't think of, and they're able to respond to things. Well, that they are, right? You can you can assess it for yourself. That's the thing. Right, you know? right, right, right. People make objections for you. That's fine. If you come across an argument for or against God's existence and you don't know, it's perfectly fine. It's, it's good to go and maybe email Trent Warren. <laughs> How would you respond to this as a Catholic, right? How would God respond to this? Once he gives his response, don't just like take it as, as gospel as, as smart as Trent is. Yeah. Think about it for yourself, right? Does does his own response succeed? Does it hold water? That's the thing, right? That's good. You can let other people make the objections for you. You can allow the other people to intellectually spar. You don't even have to be one of those people. But when you're assessing things, when you're coming to your own conclusions, you take their reasons. You see, does that does that seem right? Does that strike right with me? My reason, my experience. So anyway, that that's really important. The next one we have is open minded, open mindedness, and we have over there open yet skeptical. skeptical. I'll let you take it. Yeah, not so open that you, you know, your mind is so open that your brains fall out, <laughs> but you still reasonably, so, so you have a degree of skepticism, but you're open at least to the possibility that you might be wrong, to the possibility of different opinions, different theological views, different philosophical views, and so on. So it's not just a matter of just being closed off, like I'm just going to close off the possibility that veganism is true, for instance. Um, it's, you need to be open to veganism before you can even start investigating it, those sorts of things. If you aren't even open, you're kind of just closing off this door, this level of investigation that, that you could be going down, and you're potentially preventing yourself from getting truths in that regard. So just being open to these other sorts of views, it doesn't mean that you're like, oh, you know, maybe maybe it was morally permissible to do the Holocaust, maybe we need to open it. No, <laughs> I mean, it's a matter of, it's a, it's a matter like I'm not, I'm not very open to one plus one equaling other something other than two. Yeah, well, that's precisely because you can just directly see yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. your justifications and so on. So it's just a matter of being open in principle to being wrong on certain things, but recognizing that in some cases you do have very, very good justification. For instance, with the impermissibility, right? Uh, barring the immoral anti-realists in the, the crowd. <laughs> so this next one is intellectual courage. I don't even know how to pronounce. Like, what is this word? Well, sapere aude. Sapere aude. I mean, if you're, yeah. How would we, how would we say it in Alex's What that accent? means is dare to know. Dare to know. So intellectual courage, right? Dare to be courageous in your pursuit of truth. Know. Dare to look at Moses, and even if you're like a staunch open theist, dare, dare to try to seek that truth. Dare to go beyond what you think, you know, your confines of your own worldview. See, I think, I think where Christians need to dare more mm -hmm. is really daring on the problem of evil. Yeah. I wish Christians would really take that argument seriously, as, as seriously as some of these philosophers that I, you know, have read on the problem of evil take it. And that, that, that's actually what I wanted to talk about in the next one, so I'll, I'll hold. Yeah. If you got more stuff you want to talk about, courage. I want to say a little bit. I mean, just be courageous in your pursuit of truth. Just, I mean, even if you don't like a particular conclusion, be courageous. Search, out, search for the reasons for it against it and so on. I mean, we oftentimes construct these sorts of epistemic bubbles or yeah. these social bubbles where we're just almost like self-indoctrinated in some sense. We are already exposing ourselves to alternative viewpoints. So it's that courage to, to expose yourself to different viewpoints. It's that you don't even have to agree with them, but at least exposing yourself. That takes courage. It takes courage to search the truth in this regard. Um, you can just lock yourself up in this kind of echo chamber and just listen to the views that just agree with you. But what intellectual courage enjoins you to do is to search out for, even search out for disagreement. See, what are these people thinking? If you didn't search out for disagreement, you're just, you're not increasing your probability of getting truths. Because, yeah, anyway. Yeah, how, I mean, because it, it, it can be very scary when you open yourself up to the possibility of your view being wrong. If it's a, if, if it's like a, such a central belief to you, it'd be very scary. I mean, take courage because it's threatening. Yeah. Scary. I mean, people, anyone who's gone through a process. It sounds cliche. It sounds super cliche. And it, it, I guess it kind of is. Yeah, in some sense. But uh, anyway, you know, some people, when they're going through conversion, right? Yeah. I mean, it takes courage to try to seek out those things, even though you vehemently disagree with them at that point. That takes, that takes courage. It's not easy, right? You want to live a comfortable life, but dare to be uncomfortable. That's what I say. Dare to seek the truth. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, intellectual empathy is the next one. I'll let you take this. Yeah, so this is the one uh, that it, it got me thinking when I was, I was watching a video with a philosopher who is... Uh, really, really good on the problem of evil. His name is Trent Doherty. And I was watching a video from him and he was talking about one one day how he, like thinking about the problem of evil, like really got to him one day. And I was like, I've never taken the problem of evil that seriously. I Like I've never been able to get in the shoes of an atheist 
or just a non someone who thinks that that who thinks the problem of evil is a good argument. Like I've never been where it like really bothered me, and that bothered me. Yeah, that he like it had bothered him, but it hadn't it hadn't got to the point where it bothered me, and that that bothered me, and that showed me that I wasn't exercising intellectual empathy. I didn't put it in those terms at that time, but I wasn't exercising intellectual empathy. I wasn't empathizing with the views of people that I disagreed with. Yeah, I mean, and this goes with like, oftentimes you see these different groups, they're demonizing each other, right? The one group is saying, the other group is just patently irrational and so on. And I think that's a failure oftentimes is intellectual empathy. They're not truly understanding opposing views. It's not just opposing views, it's opposing persons. The people behind the views, trying to understand them, where they're coming from, their possibility structures. Maybe they see things differently. Maybe they have certain different clashes of intuitions and so on. So it's not only understanding different views, but it's understanding different persons. It's the person behind the views as well. That you need to be able to understand, to see things, try, try to see things from their perspective. It's that empathy, which, um, I mean, it's almost like in the, in the case of racism, one of the best things to combat racism is a kind of empathy. It's like stepping into the shoes of those people that you are, in some sense, dehumanizing. Well, similarly, there's a, there's, a, 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 there's an analog with respect to intellectual views. It's like you, you demonize the opponents and you demonize the views and so on. And the best way to combat that is empathy, which is to try to get into the mindset of those people. Why? Why do they think the things that they do? And that's a way to combat it. Yeah, this turn is the chess table. You, you know, turn the chess table. You're on this side. You see things from this perspective, but try try it on the different perspective. Turn that chess table. See it from the other one's perspective. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I, w- I was trying to think of who actually came up with that analogy. I th- it may have been Josh. I think it was. I think it was Josh in his dialogue with Alex, where he was talking about turning the chess table, looking at it from the other perspective, like really looking and and understanding like how the person is playing their pieces and whether or not you you literally might be checkmated, even though you're not like expecting it or you, you don't think that you can be. Anyways, yeah, it's it's good. It's so good to to look at things from the other perspective, and I, I don't do enough of it. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that a lot of people out there as well kind of feel that way. Yeah. So we're not going to go over particular vices. Vices are basically just going to be the opposites of what we said. So instead of being... If you lack you're, those virtues. Yeah. You're like, um, yeah. anyway, intellectually lazy, for instance. Like you're yeah. just not seeking out... Or if you're not courageous. Yeah, you're not courageous. Like you, you are just locking yourself in that kind of epistemic bubble and so on. Yeah, or if you're not empathetic yeah, exactly. to these other views. So now we're just going to want to get into some tangible tips, because you know we've talked in broad brushstrokes here. I love this first one. Yeah, so 12 tips. We talked in broad brushstrokes, but now it's time to get sort of tangible. So the first thing to do, this has really helped me, at least personally. Um, it's, yeah, you exemplify this as like, yeah. We are on the same team. So did we just have on here, same team. We're on the same team. We're, we're searchers for truth. We are on a common journey. We don't have to see each other as these like flag bearing tribesmen and I've got the red team, you've got the blue team and we're <laughs> warring at each other. We're kind of like, we're unified on one side and we're on one path. And that path is trying to get a greater understanding of reality, trying to get to truths and so on. But it's just that shift in mindset, seeing the other person, your dialectical opponent as your dialectical partner. You both are on the same team trying to get to the truths together. That might, that of course will involve disagreement, right? That doesn't mean you have to be on different teams. You can still see that person. The person behind the idea with whom you disagree, or the behind the idea with which you disagree, you're still on the same team. You're both trying, you have the common goal, common goal of getting the truth. And I, I felt that way over this weekend with you and with Alex and with Trent. Yeah. Like when we were at dinner last night, it truly was ecumenical. I mean, we didn't we didn't even talk about like that much philosophy last mm-hmm. night. A, a little bit. But, but the day we talked about. Oh my gosh, yes. That the whole day was just full of philosophy. But I, I felt that way this this whole time. And you've helped me with that. You've helped me realize that we are on the same team. Yeah, exactly. So that's one thing, it's a shift in mindset. Like this is a tangible thing that you could do when you are talking with someone. Like uh, if you are a meeting or they're a vegan, like you're both are trying, you're not necessarily on opposing teams. Of course you have opposing views, but you and the person are on the same team. You're trying to get to the truth. So the second tip is a willingness to learn. <laughs> Oftentimes you go into a conversation and your full goal is to like either make that person dumb, make that make your view look super smart, um, maybe to try to talk over the person, try to show that you're you're the kind of macho they are or whatever. Um, whatever it is, you need to go into conversations willing to learn. Yeah. I'm just trying to convert, like that's not your soul. Even if you are trying to do that, you still need to be willing to learn from them. Otherwise, yeah, anyway. I was just gonna say, like the, my conversation with my brother, the the first conversation that we had, it was the exact opposite of that. I was not going in there trying to learn anything from him, not a single thing. 
And I, what I, I mean, it, it took a lot of courage on his part, and I, I couldn't see that, that he was going through this process of like, it was gut-wrenching for him to be able to do that. And I wasn't able to recognize that. I wasn't trying to learn anything from him. Yeah, so it's... Just yeah. recognize that they have certain fruits in their worldview. They have certain, they have a perspective on things that potentially you could learn from. And that will open you up to certain like, paths of truth that you might have otherwise missed. So that's the second one. The third one is say, I don't know. We, we already covered this one, but like, truly, get in the habit of saying, I don't know. <laughs> like, one thing that you can think, yeah, if you're a theist, you can just remember that you're not God. Well, any, I guess anyone can, can <laughs> unless you're a pantheist or you're a panpsychist. No, yeah, that's not, that's not God. Uh, but yeah, you, you're going to have some false beliefs and, and you're going to, there's going to be things that you don't know. So just be prepared to say, I don't know. I mean, and it's it, what's behind it. Why, why we don't want to do that. Insecurity. There, well, it's insecurity. Yeah. Or pride. It's either pride or insecurity. Yeah. You're finishing all of my sentences, Joe. <laughs> yes, we're mind melted here. Yeah. yeah. But yes, yeah, we're quantum that. entangled. But like, listen, like, it sounds basic, but think about it. How many times you go around in life and, like, someone brings up a really good objection and you really don't know how to respond, but you're just, like, trying to spin webs of, like, BS. Like, oh, well, <laughs> it's like, come on, um, say you don't know. You're, uh, you, you gave an example of that. Yeah, we, and, and our dinner this. No, no, no. You, you, uh, you gave an example. I don't want to call you out. I don't want to call you out. No, but, okay, so Alex gave an example. He gave an example of an old debate. Long, it was like five, six years ago. He gave an example of a debate where with the point that you hadn't thought of, and you were just kind of trying to respond to it. But now you learn not to be able to do that. You learn to say, I don't know, in those sorts of contexts, and it's perfectly fine. McClatchy and Lazarus. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, anyways. Just, yeah, I mean, again, it sounds trite, but like, I reflected on myself before I started thinking about all these sorts of things, and I caught myself so many times not saying, I don't know what I didn't, like, I truly didn't know. Just say, go get in the habit of saying it, and that's fine to admit, and like, that doesn't mean you have to like, change your view on the matter to say, I need to research this further, I'm sorry, but I, I don't know. Yeah, and, and another thing is that if, from a Christian perspective, it can like do away with the stereotype that Christians are know-it-alls. So it's it's good that that can tear down that that uh, stereotype or help to. Yeah. Okay. So number four, our fourth tip was put the truth and love center stage. So trying to love your dialectical partner and not necessarily see them as someone that you have to crush or refuse or whatever. Trying to I don't know, just putting love center stage, serving them at center stage, and. Well, love, love is, yeah, love is putting the emphasis on the other person. And so when you do that, it's, it's no longer that your insecurities are like driving your responses. Rather, you're loving on the other person and you're able to like actually listen to them and understand them. And you, so it's, it's really about the other person. And it, it really does. I mean, it can open you up to, I mean, it, it can open you up to, to start to exemplify all of these different virtues that we've covered. If you just, if you only just f focus on loving the other person, a lot of these other virtues are just going to start bubbling out sort of naturally from that organically. Exactly. Number five was immerse and perspective take. So immerse, what does that mean? Well, try to listen, don't just listen. So some people, like, they would only listen to, like, one kind of content. They were only listening to, like, super hardcore, I don't even know, Calvinist, like, whatever. Like, that's all there is after the, some people, they, they, they this yeah. goes back to the echo chamber point. They're not immersing themselves themselves in viewpoints with which they disagree. They're not exposed. They're not even exposing themselves to disagreement. Like points, you know, they think, oh well, my side is covering objections. Yeah, but of course, you're getting it from your own side. Of course, they're gonna. They might not construe the objections perfectly well, and they're gonna be further rejoinders to what they say. So I just immerse yourself in different viewpoints. Listen to different podcasts and so on. If you're Christian, listen to the Cosmic Skeptic and Majesty of Reason. If you're a non-Christian or a non-theist. Listen to Captain Christianity, listen to the analytic Christian, or shout out, of course. But anyway, that's just one thing. Try to immerse yourself, listen to different podcasts, and read different books, and so on. Like, you'd be surprised, so many people just, all they do is they just buy one kind of content. It's, it's just, I mean, again, there's something wrong with like just tending to listen to one kind of content because you might be interested in so on, but try to immerse yourself and try to explain yourself. These other sorts of things. Numbers are effective. Take. Number six is probably my favorite one. And it, it, let's, let's try to go through these quickly so yeah. we can do some QA. So yeah, we'll be really big. But number six is explore, don't expose, and rid the game mindset. So can we just like pause on that? Can we just like explore, don't expose, and rid the game mindset? Explore things. Don't try to expose other people as irrational or something. Like, 
I don't know. When I originally started, way back when, getting into these sorts of things, I just wanted to expose people with whom I disagreed. Like, oh, yeah. you've got to be really too silly buffoon. <laughs> 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 yeah. But, like, that's not an exploration mindset. You're trying to explore these matters with your partner. Yeah. And that's, well, that's the whole thing of being on the same team. You both are explorers, joint explorers together on a journey. And rid of this game mindset, like, you're scoring points for your team. Like, that's a game mindset. Like, that's just... So stupid. <laughs> and all this yeah. time, right? I, I think in this sort of way. I catch myself. And so, yeah, rid yourself of that mindset. Don't see these sorts of worldly discussions as just a game. That you, like the other person's upon you to try to win points, these dialectical points, and whoever has more points at the end of it. No. So number seven and eight, I'm actually curious like what you mean by those. So number seven, you are not out of your ideas. ideas. So if you identify yourself with your ideas, an attack on the ideas is an attack on you. And so what that means, at least in conversations with people, of course, this doesn't mean you can't have people held beliefs and so on, but when you're in conversation with people with whom you disagree, try to, in some sense, distance, distance yourself. Try not to identify yourself with your ideas, with your beliefs. Otherwise, like I said, criticism of those is an attack on you yeah. personally. It's an attack on me. And then my defense mechanisms go up. Yeah. Then I'm in a tribalistic mode. Then all the adrenaline is, is flooding and so on. So if you, if you recognize that you are not your ideas and you can achieve some kind of detachment when you're at least discussions with people. It's just a recipe for good things to occur. Amen. 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> number eight, um, put away the boxes. So, um, yeah, what do you mean by this? This means that you're like, you know, you get on college and pack some boxes. No, that's not what I mean. That was just stupid, wasn't it? Okay. Um, okay, put away the boxes. Don't box people in. Like, Alex is just this, like, new atheist, and he's in that box. That's, all, that's what he belongs to. All these uh, preconceived characters of, of new atheists are just kind of like Alex. He's just this screechy thing. <laughs> like, that's the sort of thing. Like, take people out of those boxes. I know, like, when I, you come across someone, and you fail to see their individuality, their uniqueness, and you just, you, kind of lump them into this pre-existing character, like, oh, they're just this new atheist type and so on. Sometimes there is predictive value in that, but setting that aside, um, when you're really trying to get into a communication with someone and you're really trying to get the truth with them, put away the boxes. Don't try to shove them into this pre-existing con conception of the kind of person that they are. Oh, they're just going to think this way. They're going to have these values and so on. Number nine is another one of my favorites, and I'll, I'll cover it. So it's, it's go slowly. And uh, there was a guy, a philosopher that I've had on my channel, his name is Thomas Bogardus. And he told me this one time, he's like, philosophy is best done slowly. And that's one thing that's really been solidified in my work as I've done debates with Stephen Woodford, when we were able to really slow down and look at the arguments and analyze. And uh, there wasn't this pressure of like having to give a response immediately. And I, I just feel like that is so overlooked, under neglected, underappreciated. This just doing philosophy, you're thinking, just do it slowly. Exactly. Number 10 is steel man. So we all, of course, know this. Uh, yeah. One of my professors, interestingly, said straw person. So that was interesting. Instead of straw man, I was like, oh, okay, it's inclusive. That's interesting. It's a revision. I mean, okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that was interesting. He said steel person. I was like, what are you talking about? I have no clue what you're saying. And I was like, you mean steel man? He said, oh, yeah, yeah. But anyway, setting that aside. Yeah, steel man. Don't straw man steel man. So just when you're criticizing things, try to see the kernel and what they're getting at. Even if they word it poorly, even if they're giving a kind of poor objection, you're like, okay, the way that you put it actually wasn't that good. Here's what's wrong with it. But you're actually getting at this one more fundamental problem. This more this deeper problem that thinkers really are getting. Let's talk about that because that, that's, that's a more promising way to go. Yeah. Let's try to steel man your opponent. So I, I think that there's actually like a kind of middle ground between straw manning and between steel manning. I don't know what you would call it. Nun manning? Middle manning? Middle manning? Middle where you're not like, you're not actually trying to um, like caricature their views, but you're also not really trying to like look at the most, uh, the strongest form of their views. And so you're kind of like just riding the middle ground. Middle manning. Is that a thing? Now it is. Now it is. Well, uh, but that's also bad. Like yeah. it's, it's also bad to just like, ju and that's kind of like, you're just trying to get away with something. You're, that, that's what it strikes me as, is yeah. that you're trying to just like attack or, or respond to the, like a middle version of an argument, yeah. as opposed to like the best form of the yeah. argument. Yeah, and I mean, listen, I mean, if someone gives you a crappy argument, it's not strongmanning to address that crappy argument, right? Of course, like address it. 
But if, if you can see that they're getting at some more fundamental problem, you can, you can, I can bring that up. Like, here, you can help. This is how you're helping your dialogue partner. This is all about being on the same team. It's precisely because you're on the same team as them that you're helping them out and trying to see truths that they might not have otherwise seen because they have such a bad argument in this regard. But, like, okay, you're getting at something deeper. You're getting at something deeper that thinkers have really thought about and that is actually a really big issue. So that's still many. So we only have two more tips. If you guys have questions, then go ahead and start lining up over here. Uh, there's a line on the floor. So the first person just stand on that line and Alex is gonna actually hand a uh, microphone to the first person. There's like a line in the concrete right there. There you go, yeah, yeah, just stand right there. And then if you have a question, just line up behind Scott. So the last two, Again, there's so many of my, so many of these are my favorites. I know, right? Okay. They're all so good. No, the second last one is don't psychologize. Okay, so like, you know, if you're if you're a Christian, if you're an atheist, or whatever, so often we find ourselves just like psychologizing our opponents. Like they only think this because they have some insecurities, or maybe they have like daddy issues or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but, but like you're, you're trying to psychologize them away. It's almost like you're delegitimizing them, and it's like you're almost. You're poisoning the well in some sense for your audience when people listen to you. It's like you're not really giving them the due respect that they're owed as a fellow interlocutor. Well, and you're also just not seeking the truth. Yeah, you're just you're not seeking the truth. You're really just trying to do psychology, and you're doing it as an amateur. This is the game mindset as well, right? Yeah, you're trying to win because you're showing that your opponent has a certain psychology, which somehow is like epistemically delegitimating. Right? It delegitimizes them as a proper interlocutor in this kind of discussion. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah, that's the eleven. Don't Why do you think people are drawn to that view? I'm just kidding, because that's psychologizing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there's a proper place to ask, like, what, is, what are some motivations for people to have this view? Like, are there psychological roots? And it might be important to do that, but psychologizing, as we're using here, I think has this more, I guess, negative connotation, where it really does refer to people avoiding the, the, the arguments and instead going behind the arguments and maybe they have some deep insecurity from which this argument is springing. I think it's that kind of context that we're, we're going against. And then the final tip. Final final tip. Well, actually, I'm going to let you take it. Well, okay. Now I have to unlock the phone. Oh. <laughs> okay. De-weaponize. Yeah, de-weaponize. So don't see arguments as weapons. Like, all too often, again, this is something that I was at, yeah. that I fell into when I was just beginning my journey. I would, like, find out an argument, find out an objection or something that, like, favored my view. And I use I turn it into a weapon. I go around and, like, beat people on the head of it, like, figuratively. Um, but like, yeah, I, I, I saw this argument as a weapon. Like, oh, I can use this against people. And I just move it out. Just like, yeah, like, don't see these arguments as weapons. Rather, they're tools designed to serve each other, these dialectical partners. If they're weapons, you're on different teams. You're going against one another. Yeah. You're trying to clash and so on. So yeah, I mean, I, I've used arguments as weapons so often, yeah. so often. I, I, the, the, one of the most poignant times I can remember is again, going back to this first conversation I had with my brother is, and it was like so bad because not only was I trying to weaponize an argument, I had just learned about the argument. <laughs> exactly. And so like, I, yeah, I like you're took the argument. You're not careful enough. Yes. Yeah. I mean, this is all, it's all like this web of being. Yeah. Web of virtue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's turn to some questions. So the first question is from Scott Hudson. Yeah, uh, so first I just wanted to mention that um, I, if I'm correct, a lot of these virtues are in your book, right, Joe? The Match Yes. Yeah. So highly recommend that book for anyone who doesn't have it. Uh, he did not pay me to say that. Um, but my question is, um, how do you guys, since all four of you guys have media platforms, how do you balance these virtues? Because there is something that's very different about being in front of someone and then there's kind of a natural snarkiness to YouTube, to like so and so was repeated, yeah. but it's also kind of playful sometimes, and sometimes it's not. And then you also have comment sections, which like no matter how virtuous you try to be, it's just corrosive. Um, so how do you balance those things in light of having a, a, a media presence versus in person? Carefully, I mean, I don't know that I even have a really good response to it, other than I just I try my best. I just really try to. To really seek the truth, even though that like there is this game that like you can kind of get into, and I just try to I try to like maybe maybe the best the way clips. to put it I mean you know <laughs> maybe the best way to put it is I try my best to emulate Josh Rasmussen. 
Exactly. Like he embodies so many of these different virtues just already. And so I try to like emulate him as much as I can. That's another tip that we should have. Have moral exemplars and have intellectual exemplars. So your mom- I thought you were gonna say, try to be like Josh Rasmussen oh. as like one of the virtues. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, have the moral exemplars and have the intellectual exemplars. It's a constant reminder that, yeah, I mean, this is an exemplar that we can look to and that we can try to emulate in our, in our experiences. But yeah, I mean, to briefly comment on what you said, it's very difficult. I mean, for me, I often see like these really painful, cringe uh, comments, and oftentimes I just ignore them. That's one thing that I try to do. I just completely ignore them. I don't even, I see the debate almost. I don't take the bait. Um, so that's one thing, don't take the bait. The second thing is, I don't know. I mean, I've done, of course, as people know, I've done like responses to, to Trent Warren. And I like to emphasize at the beginning that, listen, <laughs> we're on the same team here, right? Like, try to show them love to your dialectical partner. Because otherwise, like, it's a way to prime your audience. To prime your audience thinking, okay, Joe respects this person. Joe's taking this person seriously. Joe actually does, like, really want to see the truth with this person. And so it primes the audience really well. I mean, I don't know, it's kind of like a priming thing. So that's one other thing I, I do. On the line, there you go. Thank you. Um, there's a statistician named William Briggs who had a post on his blog challenging Paul Draper he believes that intrinsic probability is a mistaken concept. Uh, examples that he uses are sentences like, what is the probability that a schminge will come out? You can't understand that without defining it, and by defining it, you're adding conditions to its probability, and that we often think that there's intrinsic probability where there actually is hidden conditionals. Uh, he also talks about how probability is really just between two or more propositions rather than one thing itself. I'm curious because you guys speak often about intrinsic probability and Draper, what your thoughts are on that. I don't have many thoughts on that. I'd have to think more about it. I don't know. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah I, mean, uh, I think um, that would definitely take us into the waters quite deep. So, actually, if you want to, like, Message me on Facebook or something. I'd be happy to talk about this further. So, yeah. Or you, Matt. Pete. Hey, so. Um you don't have to push anything. You just hold it. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind um, of a weird thing. So, I guess going towards the element of curiosity. So, as an atheist, I value curiosity, right? Um, it's hard to see from a Christian perspective why curiosity would be valuable. For example, I have siblings who are still Christian. I've come out from being Christian. Um, and to, you know, encourage them to be curious about their faith and maybe potential other viewpoints, that would be, from a Christian perspective, that would be encouraging them to commit the ultimate sin, right? Yeah. Fall from Christianity. So... It, I would like to know your thoughts on like, given that, like, is curiosity still a virtue, right? Yeah, so the Apostle Paul was like, if basically, if, if all we have are hopes and dreams about the resurrection, and I think this is in 1 Corinthians 15, I believe, then our faith is in vain. And I think that's the kind of approach that I would take on that type of question, is like, he encourages people uh, I, I, I take it as like an encouragement to really think about the truth of the matter. Like if all you have is hope in Christ, that's not really going to be enough because you're still going to be in your sin. You're still going to like, so I, I, that's, I suppose, the way that I look at it is curiosity can fulfill that role. So that's... Yeah, I mean, as long as you're trying to develop all the philosophies, other virtues and so on, like being careful, being intellectually humble and so on, but like curiosity... If Christianity is true, well then, these other sorts of things, so long as you're granting that these other virtues are truth-oriented, it's just going to at least make you more likely to latch onto these further truths, and less likely to go away from the Christian faith, if, if it is indeed true, and so on. So I don't know, I, I still think that there's this fundamental value of truth even within the Christian worldview, but it is a very interesting challenge, and I think people should really think about the practice of that. Kirk. Yes. Uh, so, I'm, I'm curious whether you'd accept temperance as an intellectual virtue, just because you kind of seem to dance around it with the limitations and humility. And I also have in the back of my head, as far as openness goes, 
I think it's, it's Locke or someone like that saying that there are degrees of ascent and the extent of your ascent should be the degree of the certainty that you have. But you could always have more certainty, it seems. So if not temperance, what would be the virtue that would militate against permanent openness or permanent skepticism? Like, why should you ever say that is true and like stick with that? Didn't you kind of say something about that? Yeah, so I mean, but like not letting your brain fall out too much. Like. Yeah, like opening it skeptical, but I actually do think it's an element of um, intellectual or epistemic humility because it's a matter of being appropriately sensitive to your evidence, right? Being sensitive to your limitations, but oftentimes your evidence isn't very limited. You do have significant evidence that I exist, for instance. I have significant evidence in that regard, and because of that, because I'm appropriately in tune with my evidence, I do go ahead and say, yeah, I exist, of course. Or of course my hands are here, yeah. my camera is, yeah. and so on. So I think it's a really good question. And oftentimes, you know, we, we can, or at least me, I can emphasize that people should lower their confidence, lower their confidence, and so on. That's because oftentimes I do think, as humans, right, we suffer from excessive confidence. But there are cases where, yeah, your evidence, the appropriate response is a set, and perhaps even certainty. Like, I think I'm probably certain that something exists. <laughs> yeah, pretty safe. it makes me think of Liz Jackson and she's got like, it takes, it takes a lot of courage to believe what's true. Exactly. So like skepticism, that is, uh, I think it's, it's uh, on the level of virtue, but it's also like, uh, what am I trying to say? Belief in something that's true, trying to assent to the truth well, is like, it's, yeah. that's another virtue. We're a balancing act, right? As inquirers, we're trying to increase our stock of true beliefs and decrease our stock of false beliefs. And you can go to one of these extremes. If you try to just increase your stock of true beliefs at the expense of false beliefs, you would believe absolutely everything. Exactly, yeah. Position. Yeah, as many as you can with that, without contradiction. No, no, you're, if you're just trying to increase your stock of true beliefs, if you believe absolutely every single proposition, P and not P, you're guaranteed to believe as many truths as you possibly can, because you believe absolutely every single proposition. The thing is, you're also introducing lots of falsehoods in there, aren't you? Yeah. So that's if you ignore that extreme. By contrast, if you're only trying to go to the extreme of avoiding uh, false beliefs, yeah, avoiding false beliefs, you're not going to believe anything. You're you're just going to suspend judgment on absolutely everything, because in that case, you don't have any false beliefs. Those are the two surefire ways to maximize true beliefs and minimize false beliefs. But it's a balancing act. And some people actually might be a little bit more risky, and this goes to individual temperament. Like, it's yeah. a little bit more risky. Some people are willing to take that kind of risk and maybe believe more things. Some people might be a little bit less risky, and so they're gonna stay a little bit more towards the agnosticism side. But like trying to strike a balance between those. Of course, you cannot go to either of those extremes. I do not recommend it. <clears throat> All right, so two more questions, and I think that'll close us out. Hey, uh, sorry if this is a little roundabout hypothetical. You know, I just, this kind of made me think of it. So. If you kind of imagine a world in which, say, there's two people who want the world to be two opposite ways based on some axiom. So person A wants the world to be like A, and person B wants the world to be like not B. And so say you're in that situation, and one of those people, let's say the first one, is kind of ignores these epistemic values that we're talking about. They play more towards the you know, cognitive dissonance, emotive reasoning stuff. You know, we could quibble about whether that's more effective, but let's just assume that it is. And so if you exist in that world as that other person with the opposite, you know, desire for the way the world should be, you know, what are your thoughts on the relationship between your desire to use those epistemic values, which, you know, on their own would be good, but at the same time might bring about a world that you don't want to exist? So, like, are there kind of certain situations where you see, you know, uh, a relationship or an interplay between the desire to have those epistemic values, but also the outcomes that they, you know, will create, especially when you're with people who might not really care and just want power or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So this is, this is really good. So this is, it's difficult. Um, and this is going to be a case where I tend to say, I don't know, but that we're going to eventually get there. Let me just explain something. So can you explain, can you explain like what, cause I didn't follow along so with the question. Imagine that cultivating lots of imagine a world where cultivating lots of these intellectual virtues actually like maybe that like ended up in more false beliefs, ended up in a bad world. Like, okay. Lots of negative things going on. Okay. That's essentially how I was taking taking your question. Um like should we actually cultivate these virtues in that kind of mm. or should we go with the approach, even though it's epistemically vicious, that nevertheless makes the world in some sense better and maybe So it's all, it's, like, it's like a question about what's most practical? Sort of, but like it's like what do you do in that situation? That's kind of how I see it. And like yeah. there are cases in the real world where this actually happens. That's what I wanted to point out. Yeah. So for instance, um it's a very tragic disease, it's called Huntington's disease, and um it's genetic. And a lot of people who are at risk, because let's say one of their parents had it, 
They purposely choose not to seek out the evidence. They purposely choose not to get the, the genetic tests done. Why? Well, because if they do, it's a death sentence midlife. And it's very, very bad. It's very, it's not a good progression of illness. So they specifically and purposely choose to be in the epistemic dark about their condition. And that seems reasonable, doesn't it? I mean, I don't know, for me, I don't really think I'd want to know that. So it's a balancing act. I don't know. I have to take a case-by-case basis. It's a balancing act. Sometimes you actually might have to balance um, seeking for true beliefs with the utility involved, with the, the goodness and badness valuation considerations. So it's it's a really good question. And it's super yeah, there's nothing I can really add on top of that either. So. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a big philosophical issue on that as well. Thanks, Greg. All right, Michael. So I understand for a sufficiently intellectually curious person, it won't be an obligation or anything, but when you're looking at both sides of the evidence for a particular position, is there a point at which, like, you are there criteria to be met uh, when you can say, okay, I think I understand enough about what these people who disagree with me say that I can make up my mind? Or when, when does one figure that out? What I would suggest is, like, Find someone who you know is like really well versed in philosophy, find someone like that, and then ask them like, what are the best resources on, on this particular subject? But what are like the top recommended or like most uh, uh, cited sources in like the problem of evil is one thing that I like, uh, I think about a lot. And so uh, I've got friends who I can ask like, you know, what are the best, who, who's like the top person who's publishing on the problem of evil right now? And like, I'll go read that. And so that's uh, that's one thing that I would suggest is find someone who you can get who like is really familiar with the dialectic and can give you like the top names, top papers to read and then go familiar familiarize yourself with those sources, the top ones in the in the field of that particular topic. That's good. Um, and you might still ask, but even after I've done that, like how do I know or like how am I justified like do I have enough like what's the criteria by which we're deciding this? It's difficult. This is getting to the problem of the criteria. Like, which is first? Do we go Methodist? Do we go particularist? I'd say it's just a case by case basis. It depends on the issue, it depends on the dialectical context. It just depends on so many different factors. So I have to see like a case by case basis as to whether or not, and there's no like surefire principle that can be universally applicable to these different contexts. That was a good tangible suggestion for what to do. Like, find someone that is steep in that field who really is in that good of a position to be able to say that, yeah, I really do know what that's about. I take a firm stance on it. Um, go to them and ask them for the resources and consult. So that's that's what I'd say. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. So. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now, and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?